Neuroscience is the study of the brain on a hard physical level. Think neurons, dopamine, magnetic resonance imaging. It takes millions of dollars and years of scientific training for a glimpse into the inner workings of the human brain. So what could the ancient art of magic have to teach modern brain science? Well, you might be surprised. Meet Apollo Robbins, master pickpocket and adept at the discipline we call magic. With Apollo's help, neuroscientists Steve Macknick and Susanna Martinez Conde of the Barrow Neurological Institute have gotten a sneak peek into the world of magic, and they're learning things about the nervous system that magicians have known for years. Science, meet your old friend magic. It's been a long time. Scientific American Mind invited this unlikely group to our New York offices to show us exactly what magic reveals about the brain. We sent Apollo out on the street to work his um, <clears throat> magic on some hapless New Yorkers. Meanwhile, Steve and Susanna are watching from the safety of our studio. They'll tell us how Apollo exploits the nervous system in order to create the illusion of magic. What I'd like for you to do is try to do what I do. Put the nickel on your forehead, like this, and just press it on there. In fact, to make this easier, let's switch places like this. So it's staying, all right, yeah, good. So push a little bit harder like this. And it, here's the trick is, if you wrinkle it here, let me push a little bit harder. Close your eyes just a little bit. That's not too hard when I push, right? Okay. So now wrinkle your forehead like this to get it to come off. You can't use your hands, but just wrinkle. Just, do this, like on the, just tap the back. It's not coming off very easily, is it? It's amazing, because it's not on your forehead anymore either, is it? Does this feel? It doesn't feel like it's there anymore, does it? See, it does for a little while, and that's what's confusing, because you feel it afterwards, just like it feels like the watch is still on your wrist, did not it? It's over here. It's kind of strange, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're starting a whole collection. But you're a nickel ahead, so thank you. What Apollo is trying to illustrate with the nickel trick is how he can create a sensory after image of a percept on your skin. So he presses the nickel against her forehead and that leaves a mark in her skin, but also leaves a mark in her perception. We call that an after image. So long after the nickel is gone, she still feels it. The neural process underlying after images is called adaptation. And this is when a neuron will decrease its firing in response to the same stimulus because it's unchanging. So pressing a nickel to your forehead, if you hold it there for more than just a few seconds, the neurons are desensitized. And so basically she had no reason to think the coin had been removed at all. So how did Apollo get her watch? Using the magician's most powerful tool, misdirection. Apollo is uh, forcing her to concentrate all of her attention about what's happening on her forehead where nothing is happening after he removes the coin, but by her focusing her attention there, she's taking away her attention from other locations on her body, such as her wrist, her pockets, and all of these places where he can be stealing her belongings. We tend to think we know what's going on around us most of the time, but a limitation of the human brain is its inability to focus on multiple things at once. You've got a one-track mind, you can only pay attention to one thing, and while you're pay paying attention to that thing, you're suppressing everything around it, and that's one of the things that we've shown with our research. Magicians use this limitation of the human brain to control what they call the frame or area of attention. When you direct someone's attention, it's a lot like when you're directing a movie. You have the camera shots that you want to establish. There may be establishing shots, close-ups. So in this piece, as you watch me guiding someone's attention around, uh, if you focus on their sight lines as they're watching the activity, sometimes it goes broad, sometimes it goes narrow, like a narrow laser beam into a point. Um, the idea is to be able to control those frames of attention. Watch now as Apollo misdirects this volunteer's attention. Turn this way just a little bit, come over here. Uh, so if you hold that coin inside your hand, does it feel like it's inside your hand right now? Yeah. Would you be surprised if I could take it out? Yeah. Good. Open your hand. That's the easy way. <laughs> Further out. Make it harder for me. Hold on to my wrist, but squeeze. Okay. Squeeze tight, but watch it close. See, if you watch it too close, it looks like it goes away. All right. That's not between the fingers. It's here. Turn your <laughs> hand around. It's not between your fingers either, because right now it's sitting on your shoulder. Take a look. 
Take it off? Yeah, but do it again this way. Hold your hand up a little bit higher. See, the first time you can almost see when it goes. When you do it this way, it's right back on your shoulder again. <laughs> it's a little bit confusing, but use it this way one more time. Close your hand very tight. Watch it from above. Just lower your hand just a little bit, but squeeze very firm so I can't quite get in there. Here, watch it slow. It's right about here. Back on your shoulder. The other one. Sorry, open your hand. Turn your hand over. Look underneath the face of your watch. <laughs> wow. So they're strange, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> in this case, Apollo is actively leading the volunteer's attention, something neuroscientists refer to as a top-down process. In active misdirection, that's when the magician instructs the public to voluntarily pay attention to one or other location. When Apollo is asking his mark, look at this shoulder, look at the other shoulder, that's active misdirection. He's actively engaging the subject. Attention can also be manipulated from the bottom up, directly through our senses. Sudden, unexpected changes in the environment grab our focus. Watch as Apollo misdirects this volunteer with a seemingly random plastic crustacean. If I give you the nickel to focus on, and here, squeeze very tight, so I can't take your watch off because it comes off the end of the wrist, yeah. but squeeze firm is dead. Where was your wallet at? My wallet Because I had to rearrange somewhere. things a little bit. Double check your front pocket, see if it's still there. Still there? There's nothing on this side, is there? Do you remember the date on your nickel? No, I haven't looked at my nickel. All right. But I think what? my wallet just moved. Your wallet just moved? Well, there was something inside here. Do you mind if I show them where there was? Because inside here a while ago, you had some... I had something. That belonged to you. <laughs> oh, rather odd, isn't it? It's... I don't Is that think that's where part you of your went lunch. to lunch? The shrimp well, it's rather unusual because I noticed it seemed like you brought a little bit of your lunch with you. You yeah. had some utensils and you were right in this pocket here too. I had utensils. What is that? <laughs> Yeah, I have my, uh, my oh, knife. Oh, your knife, yes, yeah, because I, I was picked up from the restaurant. And all this didn't take more than 60 seconds, did it? It looks a lot like your watch. It does. Oh, okay. <laughs> Attention can work like a reflex. You see something that is highly unusual or very salient, such as a bright light or a loud noise, and your attention is going to automatically direct very strongly to that location. Since the mark's attention is on the shrimp, he doesn't realize that just inches away from the shrimp, he has his own watch that has been stolen and is on Apollo's wrist. There are many different ways that magicians can short circuit our attentional mechanisms. See if you can figure out what's happening here. Try to follow along. If you put the cap on the pen, it looks like it goes away, but it goes behind the elbow. Then the pen goes away. But not completely, because while you're focused on the cap, the pen is up by the ear. We'll do that again. If we put the cap back on the pen, it looks like the cap goes away. Well, not completely. Again, this is sometimes just an illusion, and then these things are sometimes just in your head. Here, Apollo manipulates something called joint attention, the propensity for humans to focus on things that other humans focus on. As we follow Apollo's gaze in this trick, we pay attention to areas where nothing is really happening, while we miss the important action. We can't resist. Our brain is hardwired with specialized cells called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are the neurons in your brain that allow you to see what other people are doing, and they also allow you to sympathize with what they must be feeling while they do it. And so this is an incredibly important part of joint attention because it'll, they allow you to see what other people are paying attention to and how they're moving their body and their gaze in order to pay attention to something and also allow you to then do the same exact thing so that you can follow whatever it is that they're interested in. Now magicians, of course, use this to their advantage. In practice, magicians combine all of these different manipulations of attention and a dash of humor to create the perfect storm of misdirection. It leaves us pretty much helpless. A totally new concept uh, for us in neuroscience was that they use humor to actually suppress attention. And so they'll, in, in Apollo's pattern, you'll notice he uses a lot of different jokes at specific times. Like he'll say things about him being on parole and think this might violate his parole or he's doing community service. But the fact is that he's using these types of things in order to get people to laugh and he can actually get away with certain things while they're laughing because they can't pay attention. And this is obviously very critically important to understanding 
how humor relates to our attentional mechanisms cognitively, but also possibly a handle into how the other emotions relate to cognition as well. And so we uh, have gotten very interested in this aspect of what the, what the magicians have brought to the table in terms of what it means for the neuroscience. For more on the neuroscience of magic, check out the November issue of Scientific American Mind or Steve and Susanna's new book, Slights of Mind, available from Amazon.com.